Hi guys and thanks for joining us for the first session of Live Engineers 101 in 2021. This week I am joined by Chris Parker who works with Unaka, Kelis and the Amazons. So Chris, thanks for joining us today. Just to start off, if you just tell everyone who's listening and watching just a little bit more about yourself. Hi, I'm Chris Parker. I'm a sound engineer, uh, tour manager, production manager, lighting guy, bit of everything, uh, weird hybrid mutt man from England. I'm in Cambridgeshire, but I lived in Hertfordshire for ages. I work full time for a production company called Patchwork London. Worked there for about just over three years. How did you become a professional sound engineer? Tell me your story. I, like most techs, started out being a musician. Um, so I played mm -hmm. bass, and I played bass since I was 12. And just my whole life, I was, well, since I was from, from 12, age 12, I was always going to be a full-time musician. I was just constantly, like, reading books, watching sort of videos, and just, like, playing hours and hours a day. Um, and being in any band, saying yes to everything, um, gigging around London when I was 14. And then after my A-levels, it was uni time, and I was like, oh, when my mum was like, you'll make no money as a musician, just wait till you've retired, hit, all, hit up all the pubs, work a job on the side. I was like, yeah, fair, but I'm gonna go for it anyway. So that was kind of my, I had like a fork in the road. It was go do chemistry or go do music tech. I went to music tech at University of Hertfordshire. Um, I chose tech because I, just, I found the sort of the theory side of it at school a bit, a bit long and I thought tech is kind of a good place to be in and I had a really good music tech teacher. He's also an engineer um, around the Hertfordshire area, Nick Kozak, he was wicked, well he is wicked. Um, yeah, I see him every so often and it's nice to catch up and I feel like you know, there's a lot of people who you know you sort of think like you're the reason I'm doing this, still doing this and mm -hmm. some of these bands and people that are kind of guys doing this direction but um, yeah Nick's probably the first guy who kind of got me on the road to do music tech and he was saying you know it's quite a stable career so I went home and told my mum you know it's a stable career like there's plenty <laughs> of jobs in it and listen them off but um, yeah to be honest I was always wanting to be a bass player and never really had any aspirations to be an engineer um, so I went to uni, um, and just worked my butt off, really. And then, yeah, I, I got, I had like a load of part-time jobs. So I worked at the studio at the, at the university for a bit, and then I worked at the students' union, uh, the venue there, um, which was a 2000 cap, uh, super modern. It was called the Forum uh, at the University of Hertfordshire, <clears throat> and it's amazing. All the all the crew there were incredible. I learned so much there and that's sort of how I decided I want to be a technician and a sound engineer I worked in the studio for a bit but I found it you know you can stay there all night tuning a kick drum and you know <laughs> and I don't know I'm a bit, I've always been a bit hyperactive and just you know like mm -hmm. bouncing in one space and I just I just didn't have the patience for it I love I just love the live you know it's one and done you go in it goes well but it doesn't go so well you know, the crowd have a good time, you know, you kind of, you kind of vibe off that energy. Whereas I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of magic about this being in a studio and, you know, all your stuff gets immortalized mm -hmm. in print and you kind of always got that record. You can put all your records on the wall, but no, I just love the energy from touring. But anyway, I got an opportunity to, one of my friends knew the violinist from a band called Lanterns in the Lake. And he booked me in touch with them to be the sort of the first engineer they'd ever had. Um, and that was the moment where I realized I absolutely love this. I bought a band, my friend's band into the forum because I hadn't really mixed any bands really, to be honest. Like, I mean, I've watched loads of great engineers and mixed loads of great bands there, but you know, it was, it was always guest engineers. We'd never really be behind the desk too much. Occasionally mixing monitors for PAs like the cheeky girls and Venga boys and things. But I mean, it's not like a full band. So, um, yeah, I went on this first tour with Lance on the Lake. And yeah, I mean, I was, I was playing bass a lot at the same time. And I was freelancing a lot as well and doing random techie jobs just from local production companies, just through the, through the forum, to be honest. It was all sort of the, the people there would have, I'd meet people there who have their own production companies locally and I'd just kind of do bits and bobs and a bit of everything. 
And then, yeah, I found it with playing bass. Someone told me, I had like a mentor, like a bass player mentor, and he said, you can't be a technician and a bass player. And I was like, screw you, yes, I can. I can do both these things. So I'd come home from these freelance jobs, play bass till sort of 4 a.m., learning these songs, then sleep for a few hours, then go out and do the, the gigs and stuff. And it would, it would just be like, abs- like no sleep, just mental, had all the energy in the world really to do it. Um, so back in the day, God, can I say that yet? <laughs> I mean, it feels like it's like eight years ago or something I was doing this. And then since then, since I did the Lance on the Lake tour, that just led to another tour and another tour. And then it's all these one-off connections, like promoters, I don't know, they're always, it's always, always feels like everything's constantly right place, right time. But I mean, yeah. these opportunities are just like flecks of dust. And I don't know, there's just all these connect the dots things going on, like we were saying earlier mm. um, before, yeah, before we started recording. Like, it's crazy how everything just kind of clicks into place and mm. you meet it's, people. It's funny, you can look back, can't you? Yeah, you exactly. For that there, and you can see the butterfly effect of where things have came from. Yeah, I'd like to map it out on a wall one day and just have that, like, yeah. you know, like the murder mystery thing where you're just connecting the dots and just, like, yeah. I don't know, trying to find out. I, I'm very similar to you because I was, I went to uni, did popular music degree. Right. I'm a, I'm a drummer. So I was okay. a drummer for 15 years before. Yeah. But I was always the guy, again, knew how to do the PA system and learned it. And, and then I was mm. always in the band and nobody else understood. And it got ridiculous that even doing a, in a function band where... I was provide, I was bringing all the PA equipment, my drum kit. So function band, doing a wedding, load in, I would set up my drum kit and the PA, then yeah. sound check the band with the iPad, then mix yeah. the band from the iPad while playing the drums with one right hand yeah. on that, left hand on the <laughs> iPad, checking everybody's in near monitor mix. Yeah. And that's the first five songs. And yeah. then you, you, then you can relax. <laughs> <laughs> and, but you do, you, you get those, the musicians who, understand or don't um yeah. it's funny what you're saying about obviously bands get being a certain level before they can afford to bring in an engineer because mm-hmm. most bands don't get paid until they're at a certain level and can no, then definitely. go well we pay ourselves or we bring on an engineer and a lot of time when they bring on an engineer it's that kind of you're kind of doing it for free or you're looking for that opportunity yeah and we've all done those gigs you know mm-hmm. um, or the opportunity to mix a band in a good venue yeah. I've, I've done that a handful of times just so I can go, oh, I've mixed in that venue now. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, I mean, we love it, don't we? It's like, um, you know, it's, it's, I sort of feel like it's not all about the money, really, is it? It's like, <laughs> I mean, you need to pay bills and everything, but, you know, when you're learning, I mean, you're loving it at the same time. Like, there's, there's totally no, no, like, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing, like, a tour for like a quarter of what a regular day rate would be when you're starting out to go on a tour and learn these things. Like, oh, definitely. Um, it's, I mean, it's so much fun. Like, mm. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's great. I mean, yeah. when you're at that stage, just, yeah, it's, it's definitely the right thing to do. Just get out there, just say yes and just do well, stuff. So you, at the moment you're working for a production company. Um, so yep. have, how do you compare working full time for a production company compared to being a, a freelancer or working in a venue? To be honest, it's, I mean, being a freelancer and being full-time is it's fairly similar, really, um, f- for me at least. I think I can go and sort of do what I want, generally speaking. It's, I, I mean, it's just great to have a good team around me. I think I think I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't really want to work full-time for a production company. I think, like, unless it's the right one. Like, I think Patchwork are brilliant. I think they're really, like, ev- I love all the guys there. You know, they kind of let me do what I want and and learn with them as well. You know what I mean? Like, it's like a team. Mm-hmm. We're a team. So if I'm sitting at my desk and I'm just like, if I don't know something, I can just be like, hey, how does this work? And someone just, one of my colleagues will tell me. It's great. Um, learn so much through them. I think it was good to to be freelance for a while and just, you know, do these, do everything I can. But even, you know, with the, with the production company being part of them, it's like, I can do what I want if I wanted to go and, do something just because I wanted to do it. It doesn't have to be all about, you know, mm-hmm. making money and everything. It's like, I think 
being part of the company is just, yeah, it's wicked. I really love it. I think it's so good the just different it. opportunities are, as well, I'm assuming for the production company, you probably do certain events or gigs that you wouldn't have normally done? Yes and no. Not, not really, to be honest. I think one, something that was important for me was to not join the company and rely on them feeding me gigs, you know, and just like using my skills as an engineer and just being sort of fed the gig. I'd rather kind of be doing my own thing and going out there and meeting people, but also just having the support of, of the company. Mm -hmm. um, like I think, yeah, I, I don't want to, I kind of want to keep, you know, bring in the bands that I bring in, you know what I mean? And just, yeah, I think there definitely has been some opportunities, but then, I think like I probably would have done it as a freelancer as well, you know. I right. think like I was working very closely with Patrick for a long time before I was full time with him. Um and you know, doing lots of gigs with him. But um even being full time, I kind of you know, a lot of time I'm just touring all year and then I come back and it's like, Hey guys, like good to see you. I haven't seen you in about four months. How's everyone doing? <laughs> Stick the kettle on. Um so, what bands have you been working with then over the years? And who are so, you doing currently? There's Lanterns on the Lake, who I do front of house for, occasionally tour manage and say very loosely production manage when there's bits of extra production things coming in. Um, Lucy Spragan, I've been mixing, she was like the second band I ever worked with. The promoter at um, the Lanterns on the Lake London show was Lucy's manager and tour manager. And he was at the show and he thought it sounded really good. So, um, Coincidentally, we got put in touch to be Lucy's new engineer. So I hopped on that and that's been brilliant. And that's been lots of tours and things. And I've tour managed that, tour managed Lucy and production managed Lucy on the Academy tours. Um, crikey, let's have a look. You know, you know, it's like those things when you, <laughs> someone asks you a question, you just, <laughs> your mind just goes completely blank. So I toured with a band called Yonica for a long time. They were wicked, had some really, really, really good times with them. Toured with the Amazons. Touring with the Amazons, yeah, they're wicked. That's, they're really great guys. It's nice to kind of just turn it up. And it's just really, really good rock music. There's hardly anything like digital or anything on that. It's just like loud amps, loud drums. It's great. Uh, currently touring with Khalees, um, which is a bit different from everything else. It's kind of like a bit of a legacy pop star right. vibe. I do monitors for that and sort of bits of production. Um, toured with the Lemon Twigs. They're an American band. Did lights on that instead of front of house, um, tour, tour managed, did lights for an article called Elderbrook, did monitors for an article called Wilkinson, front of house for a guy called Will Hurd, and monitors for Fickle Friends. Yeah, I'm literally reading from a list here. <laughs> so you can wow. probably tell from my le head to it to the left, but... Um, I, yeah, well, like I did a gig <clears throat> it was Fickle Friends. I'm trying to think of it, because I've met you once or twice, I think, over yeah, the, I think it would have been some of the Glasgow venues, probably on Yonica tour. Uh, gar the garage was Yonica, I think, yeah, right, wasn't okay. it? Because <clears throat> yeah, I remember Fickle Friends did a gig at Glasgow University a few years back. We provided the car yeah. and stuff like that in it, but I don't know. My mind goes blank with a lot of these because they just turn out all the same gigs. Uh, no, that's, I, you, I actually had a dream last night about mixing monitors for Fickle Friends. <laughs> really? Yeah, I don't know if you get this, but I, I keep having dreams. Like, I've had a few over sort of the last year, but I get quite a lot. It's always like, it's always Reading, Reading Festival of Glastonbury. I'm doing monitors and something goes wrong and I've got to fix it. So last night I was at Reading Festival <laughs> mixed monitors for Fickle Friends. And, and it was a great show. Everything went really well. And then the house engineer disappeared. And the stage guys asked me to mix monitors for the rest of the bands on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> and I think all the kit wasn't working. And then they turned up with this big rack of in-ears and then no one had any batteries and no one turns up <laughs> on and the crowd were out there and it's just, yeah, and then I, I like woke up, I guess, like my girlfriend probably was probably thrashing around in the night, like, no, we need batteries. <laughs> uh, she, was, she was saying, uh, you're talking in your sleep. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were saying, have you got your Ofcom licenses? <laughs> It's, uh, it's really bad when you get to the stage that you haven't get done a proper gig for so long that you're now dreaming about doing a gig. I know. Oh, it's kind of fun, though. I kind of like it. It's like I'm there. Okay. Um, I, I have the, the, the nightmare of um, doing a gig and then turning up and oh, going to the desk and just doing the, I don't actually know how to do this anymore. 
you know, okay. you, you forget about it. <laughs> and uh, it was like, I turned on uh, the SD9. So my SD9's been sitting in its box for, well, 12 months nearly, at the, well, yeah, 12 months at this point. Yeah. And uh, I just sold it. So I thought, better set up, check it all over. <laughs> so I set up, turned it on, mind went blank. I just yeah. like, I hadn't been on a digital SD for so long. Mm. Uh, and it just took me a few minutes to suddenly go, where's the IO? Where, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. that was strange, but it took me five minutes back into the swing of it. Uh, yeah, I know. I had the same thing, but um, we're all going to be very slow when we start gigging again. It'll be like a changeover will take an hour. <laughs> Just can't remember I the flow. Oh, I think it's right. I think as soon as the wheels start turning, like I did a um, I did a job prep in the middle of, in lockdown. I think oh, last last yeah last year at some point, and um. Just had to set up an Allen Heath C 1500 for like a, um, a film shoot. Um, and I connected um, our Shaw wireless systems to it, the mic, so you can connect it via Cat5 and you can see the battery and the, mm. the names of the units. And um, I just, I've connected it, it didn't work. So then I just, I, I hadn't set this up before, but I just changed the IP address and it worked. I just got this massive rush of like <laughs> dopamine, serotonin, just like. I've, I've done something, that. I fixed it, yeah, I moved my brain. I've yeah. still got it. <laughs> yeah, it was great. So you've yeah. mentioned um, front house, production management, tour management, monitors and everything. Um, in terms of being a sound engineer, would you prefer being a front house or monitor? Or are you kind of both? Um, well, I was doing front of the house for a very long time, but I think that's because, you know, when bands have budget, the first thing that goes to is having a front of house engineer. <clears throat> I mean, monitor engineer comes after. So when I was on those sort of splitter tours and things where we didn't have a monitor engineer, I was always doing front of house. And I love doing front of house. I, I really, really enjoy it. Um, uh, but more recently, over the last couple of years, I've been doing monitors quite a lot. And I love that slightly more, dare I say. Um, I just really, really like the challenges that holds and just being on stage and being with the band. I think being a musician, being on, being a musician as well, I think being on stage and feeling like you're part of the band kind of yeah. scratches that little itch you've got. I think it's great <laughs> just kind of be stood and you're, you're part of them, you know, you can talk to yeah. them, you've got comms and have a laugh with them. Um, but I think I prefer monitors, you know. I think, mm. I think you feel like you're a stage manager at the same time. And you, there's, I think there's way more things that can go wrong doing monitors and there are doing front of house and I really like that mm -hmm. in a weird way I think oh, you have to be really but, switched on and on the ball yeah totally yeah. I, I just love that um I think with front of house you've just got one mix one or two you've got like 14 mixes or something and mm -hmm. uh yeah I, I think it's very it's, it's way more I think there's a lot more background work in it I think it kind of lends itself more to production management and and sort of being in, involved I think with a front of house you can rock up put your white gloves on and make it sound pretty but I think with a monitor engineer you've you got to get your hands a bit dirtier and mm. you know I think I don't know I think it's more like channel list and pre-prep and spec and just sort of problem solving way more things like even stuff like making sure they've got fresh batteries in their packs all the times and the RF coordination bloody love RF coordination <laughs> who'd, have, who'd have thought I'd absolutely <laughs> love it it's such a satisfying thing just putting it into wireless workbench and it all just kind of fires out green and yeah yeah I think I like I think I prefer monitors a little bit more okay. I think it's more what what's your um your choice of desks then for front of house monitors or both what we if you had here you go Chris here's the unlimited budget for this tour what would you like to use for either so i'm a bit weird because i really like small desks um i, I i've used the c1500 and a uh, sd11 toy monitors i mean in front of house as well i've done both but mm -hmm. i just really like that it's here it's, i haven't got loads of faders i I, just, I think it's good when you get that muscle memory and you can kind of just quickly flick around mm -hmm. and you just know it inside and out because when you go and do fly shows you don't have to like you know, like rewire your brain about where everything is. You kind of just yeah. know where it is already. And once you're going to get that muscle memory, it's, it's totally fine. And yeah, I like that. But um, for monitors, I prefer Digico. I just think, I mean, I, I think my two favorite desks are Digico and Alan Heath. I 
love Alan Heath at front of house. And I love Digico on monitors because I think Digico's routing, I really like it. I think it, I think, I don't know. It just seems to make a bit more sense to me. It seems like it's a bit more like nerdy digital computer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like the interface is a bit more like tech in your face. I think the Alan Heath <clears throat> is a bit more like smoother and modern and like, beautiful and i don't know i think oh, i don't know they both sound good I, I like alan heath at front of house alan heath gives me that midas vibe where you turn up the preamps and everything just sounds really really good like yeah. you can push it and i i always say whenever i put drums for an alan heath it just sounds incredible it just sounds like the snare yeah. would shake your chest yeah. whereas i like with digico it's a bit more like syst systematic and technical and you can kind of root things a bit better it makes a bit more sense in my brain whereas I don't know, I, just, I, I think I prefer the, on Alan Heath, I like the sort of multi-bands and the, yeah. the effects I think are a little bit nicer. So I think between those two, but I do love Midas in front of house as well. I think you can just turn those up. I mean, it depends on what the band is as well, really. If it's like a rock band, I think a Midas is great. Right. Digico is great on pop. I think it just sounds a bit like clear and, you know, pretty and you're going to get your vocals like there for I, your pop I'm very song. similar to, to what you're saying because I'm a big fan of Digico SD mm. series. Um, I had the SD9, um, but mm. I, I love an SD12 for monitors. Yeah. Just dual screen, amazing. Um, I'm, I've just sold my SD9 purely because I'm buying a D-Life. Right, okay. Um, because we've got loads of the SQ series and we've got a lot of the D-Life stage boxes, uh, like the DX16S and everything. So it makes more of a business sense for us to have a D-Live because yeah. there's more, a lot more combinations depending on what we're doing as a gig. Um, and that's purely it because I love it and it was actually quite sad mm -hmm. I saw it two weeks ago and the guy came and got it and I was just like I said, I said to Alison but I was like it's like lo losing a child <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is you know it, it, it's like my baby that I've, I've had for years and mm -hmm. my go-to um, to to then lose it um, but luckily obviously the guy has just got an SD9 so I still get the, the chance to go oh, and go. really use it um, but I'm excited about getting something new but mm -hmm. At the moment, there's just no justification to really buy it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I'm keeping my eye out for any used, maybe a C3500. Uh, yeah. Um, I've got a price for buying one new, but if I did that right now with no gigs coming in, I think yeah. I'd be on the couch. Uh, yeah, just stick with the offline editor. Oh, <laughs> totally. So, um, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to actually being able to dig into I've used the D-Live a handful of times, mm -hmm. white glove most of the time, or turn up to a venue and use it, um, but I've never really dug deep into it. Um, whereas SQ and everything are GLD, in and out, no problem. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to that, definitely. Uh, oh, they're great. I love them. They're really, really good. Um, but I can also sort of, I've had... Good, like really good shows on every desk. I, I feel the same about VI, um, Soundcraft. I feel like every time I get in front of one of those, they sound really good. So I've done some really good festivals on those. Um, I th it's like yeah, any I of these desks, they're all high level desks. They're mm. all going to sound good. They're all going to have good functionality. It's, it's yeah. a use of preference. It's, I, mm -hmm. I don't get it because you get people who go, oh no, that, desk, that desk's crap. And you're like, you can't really say that because- No, no. There's lots of people who use it. It's just not your taste. It's just like buying a top of the range car. You know, they all do things. They all go very fast. They all do what you need. It's just a preference. Yeah. Well, we say that we still got the LPM or the Yam really old Yamahas. The LS9. That. No, not the LS9s. <laughs> the, the even like the first digitals. The um, is it PM five thousand? Oh, was it PM five hundred? D. What are they call it. Oh, it's kind of you know, yeah, the big like hybrid original to analog thing where you have to yeah. get like an SD. Yeah, the, the original, those kind of, I think at a certain level, you know, because um, for instance, Pro 2s, which have been around for 50 years now, you know, it's like you get them everywhere. They're quite old. Mm. They still sound amazing, still do the job, break a hell of a lot, but. You, you get them still friendly on riders. People are mm -hmm. like, yeah, fine. You can pick up a, a Pro 2 for, for five or six grand these days in Great Nick, yeah. which is amazing. Um, it's great that those kind of level of desks have still got uh, longevity. 
Mm -hmm. You know, so, so uh, even with the SD9 or the SD series that's been around for quite a while now, you can still, uh, they'll still be there for years and years and years to come. Yeah, agreed. Um, yeah, I do, I do love a, yeah, I think Weapon of Choice is, yeah, Alan Heath definitely, they sound, they just sound really, really good. So I know like they all do. Um, when, you're yeah. in to, when you're going out on tour with the, all these bands you've mentioned, do you, get to pick what desks you're going to be working on or is it productions given to you or if you inherited a tour or anything like that? I'm, I'm pretty easy generally. I think I've got, I've got my preferences. I, yeah, I do pick my desk pretty much on every tour and every show now. Um, uh, but a lot of the time I'm doing monitors and we've got a guest front of house and I, I, like, I really want to make sure that they're comfortable Mm. And, and everything I do so a lot of the time they'll have a preference on the front of house desk and I'll have say they've got like a, they want an S5000 in front of house I'll go for a C1500 if they want to have like an SD12 in front of house I'll have an SD11 I think it's good because if the kit's coming from patchwork I think it gives them a bit of peace of mind that like I don't know if, if one of the digicodes goes down there's another digicode there and and I'm like we're both using the same systems and and making sure that engineers are comfortable was a very big thing for me. Um, because I think, you know, there's a lot of PA companies out there, like why pick us? Um, mm. and I think, I think it's just, you know, having that level of really caring and making sure that they're super comfortable, they've got everything they need. And like, if they come, like, you know, we try our very, very hardest to get exactly what they want and need and to get it to sound as good as possible. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I think more, yeah, more, more generally, I kind of, I'm pretty easy. Mainly it's like Alan Heath or Digico. If I had, I don't really like, I mean, I do get to pick, but I'm generally pretty easy, to be honest. I'm like... You've got to be flexible as, as well, you know, because it's... Yeah. We've all done those gigs where you turn up to the venue and you're not touring a desk or something. You turn up and you're just having to work with what is there. Yeah. And as long as there's always a house tech there on a desk that you're not too familiar with. Mm, um, yeah, exactly. Crikey, yeah. I did a uh, show on an SSL last year, or the year before, it would have been the year before, um, at Paradiso. Right. And I, I was watching videos of it beforehand. I mean, there's this, I mean, there's like a load of desks that just are used everywhere. Yamaha, um, Soundcraft, and Heath Digico, Midas. But then you get the odd, like, Presona spit in front of you or like SSL and um yeah this this show I did on the SSL oh man it, it was so good um but yeah I was holding this Dutch guy's hand the whole time <laughs> I was just like <laughs> oh man I, I like yeah you gotta, you gotta love a house tech really you gotta like really yeah it's, it's definitely how you, you learn to use a lot of the desks as doing a tour without touring a desk you know it's, yeah because you as long as you know what you're turning up to you know, mm -hmm. um, I've, it's not happened to me, but I've had friends who have had like, you know, their tour and uh, they're, they're given the tech spec for the venues. So they know what they're going to appear in, but they've yeah. had a few venues where they turn up and it's not. Yeah. <laughs> and, they're going, and they're going, and they've got uh, something completely different, a bit of a surprise, but it kind of keeps you on your toes. Yeah. And it also means you can create a show file for that mm -hmm. for the next time you're possibly going to be doing something. Yeah. When you, with these bands and stuff that you've been out for tours, are you, do you get the opportunity to do pre-production days with them before you go out and tour, or is it literally first gig is a pre-production? No, nah, always pre-production. I don't think I've ever done that at all. I haven't had any any kind of rehearsals, to be honest. Um, yeah, but generally, I mean, I guess a lot of the time I'm doing monitors in front of house or monitors. I don't, I don't tend to do. I mean, I think I think that crossover point I had where I was doing front of house and then monitors. I think I was doing a lot of front monitors in front of house and then I started doing more monitors. So I'm just doing monitors. So, um, monitors require pre-production really. I think mm. it's good to set those in rather than first show. Let's do this. I think I can only think of one tour where I haven't, but that was just like a last minute jump from one venue to another, to another tour. But that's yeah. like another story. Um, it, seems, it seems to be in Glasgow for, I think, because Glasgow seems to be the first date in a lot of it tours. It was in Glasgow actually. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> it was. I've had it so many times in the garage where a band turn up and it's like they haven't had a pre-production. 
This is the first day of a three-month tour. Oh, yeah, you must get it all. And they, they do the longest sound check because yeah. of just, which is, you can understand, but it seems to be classical, we get that. And we, we had, uh, I can't remember the name of the band, but we've had them where they've had all the gear delivered and the first time they've seen the gear is when it's been delivered to the venue. And right. they're going through it all and then they discover that's missing, that's missing and so on. And it's yeah. just like five or six hours. I mean, we've been called in early because they, we know it's uh, their pre-production day, but they're getting ready for the, the tour. Yeah. And then they suddenly realise that there's stuff missing from, that they've ordered from, ordered from Germany. Oh. You know, yeah. and then they're, they're, they're going to the local music store to get loads and loads and bits and bobs. Um, yeah. I, I find that, I would find that nerve wracking, especially when you're just about to go on a, a three month tour or something like that without a pre production. But it's lucky you get them. Yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah, it's great. Must, I can't imagine. I mean, I've seen some big bands not do it as well, just that first, rehearsal, first day set up and you know, I mean, there would, there would have been some pre-production, I mean, I mean tech-wise, tech I guess, but not with the band there and dialing in ears. I guess, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Do you get I, to I've, meet, always, I've always done pre-production. I'll always do you get like, to meet the band before know. even pre-production day and stuff like that? Or is it literally band, band turn up and you just introduce yourself and then go for it? Or is it a bit of... Sorry, say that again? Do you, do you get to meet the band and the, the artists before even a production day to get to know them before you go away into mm-hmm. it? Or... Not usually. Um, sometimes it'll be like a big email thread with the band and I'll email every band member saying, what do you need? What, what have you got? Mm-hmm. So I'll kind of chat to them there. Or, But you try, most of the time it's you meet them at rehearsals and that's the first time or you'll you'll know someone from the the band or the engineers or the management or someone. So you, you'll know somebody. It's not just... Um, but yeah, I'd say most bands probably just met them on the first rehearsals of the first day. Unless, yeah... I guess so. Well, with the Amazons, I've met them before already because I've been a sort of a band supporting them and then yeah. met them all through that and then a gap opened up for a depth, so depth on it and okay. as, it, as it always goes. I think that's I think that's also something to, it's a bit of a weird tangent, but when I was, when I was sort of learning, I was like, when am I ever going to f- get onto like different bands? Like, when's it ever going to happen? Because they've all got engineers. How's that going to happen? Yeah. But, you know, it's like, as soon as an engineer, as soon as like a gap opens up, an engineer might join that and then the gap opens up low. And mm. I think festival season is a really good time for that to happen as well. I think yeah. there's so many things happening. There's lots of depth needed. You just Then I think there's kind of gaps get filled and that, yeah. that's a like, big, you know, big opportunity to kind of meet new bands and hop onto it's, things. It's only happened to be once. Nobody. It's happened to me once where I was on a, a festival and I had two bands that I look after doing the same festival. And I was like, hey, excellent. I can, <laughs> yes. you know, a couple hours between. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I know a lot of friends who, uh, especially when they're over in America and the European tour circuit for festivals, and it's just like mm. chaos trying to get from A to B, trying to do so many different bands, so many yeah, festivals. Yeah. But uh, as you say, it's a good opportunity to then get your, your depping side of things in um yeah let's talk about uh like setup and stuff for yourself then in terms of um when you're working um are you a kind of use all the faders kind of guy or do you use dcas and nuke groups and all that kind of stuff a lot of snapshots or are you very much hands-on constantly wanting to keep your hands busy um very busy i'd say it's definitely more hands-on i try and I try and keep it more, you know, backline controls the levels and and the tone really. Cause you look at these amazing band show files and then you see the, you listen to the gig and it sounds incredible. And you look at the show file and it's just like there's hardly any EQ or anything on anything, you know, and the le- the fade is at zero, it's just the tracks all just balanced. I think that's where pre-production is really important to kind of get it to nail it. But I mean, it doesn't always work that way. Um, uh, a lot of the time really, or like ever, I suppose it's never quite perfect for every room, um, for every tour that you just keep it flat and the gig runs itself and you can just sit back and have a, mm-hmm. have a drink. Um, yeah, I've always been quite busy with my hands and try and like, I think I kind of like, I, I use VCAs and DCAs all the time 
always use those. I don't really use groups too much. I use them more in monitors, sort of facilitationally. That's a word for like, I use groups for like snare, kick snare. I mean, I, I use like parallel compression groups for my front of house and kick snare, but I also find it's good on um, in monitors just to do like fat snare group and just compress mm-hmm. the hell out of it. And, but um, yeah, it, I don't, I'm not really reinventing the wheel anywhere. I think, I think I just try and use my ears as much as possible and, you know, know the songs inside out, listen to the songs again and again and again and again before the tour. Um, so you know when there's going to be like a violin little lick and you can just flick it up. Mm. Um, and I think it's, I think it's quite nice as well when you're in sort of smaller venues and it's hard, harder to hear stuff. I think it's nice to, or, well, I guess it depends what it is, even in bigger venues. I think it's nice to kind of like occasionally lift things up in the mix. So to remind people that it's there because sometimes the mix just stays on one level. Mm. The band can do the dynamics there end, but sometimes it is nice just to be like, and here's a little piano run and just like tickle yeah. that up in the mix just to touch and, you know, or like it's the last song on the set. Let's just have drums going a bit, pounding a bit harder. Mm. Nothing, nothing too wild. I mean, obviously you want the vocals to cut across above everything pretty much the whole time. Well, yeah, definitely the whole time. Mm. So it's it's definitely, there's a lot of venues where, you know, you'll be riding the vocal fader the whole show because where the way the PA is positioned, you've done as much as you can to tune all the feedback yeah. out, but you just can, sometimes you, just, you can't even get, you just struggle to get the vocals over the snare drum in the room mm. itself. It's tough. So yeah, I do quite a lot of fader surfing when I'm doing front of house, that is. Monitors, monitors, I'm, I'm very, I'm very much in the mindset of, you know, this isn't, this isn't designed to be like the prettiest thing. It's meant to be facilitational and it's supposed to, it's to make the band perform as well as they can. Mm-hmm. so that's very you know your track needs to be even because I can't ride your faders the whole gig I also you find to... though if you, if you start mucking about with monitor mixes it can screw with them yeah on totally stage. No, they'll notice they'll know yeah. one, they'll anyway. once they're happy and I've done sound check I don't touch anything unless yeah. they look at me or they say there's a specific song or you know mm. the specifics but otherwise it's then don't touch your desk and just stare at them <laughs> You know, yeah, basically, eyes like a hawk. Never oh. take your eyes off. But I mean, you got to just keep my ears generally glued to the vocalists' mix mm. um, when I'm doing do, monitors. Do you um, do um, when you're on monitors? Do you use any ears for monitoring and uh, a wedge, or both, or just one? Depends what it is. It's mainly always just ears, and I just keep them glued into my head. Um, with as police, mo- as most of the is most of the artists using in ears that you look after then? Yeah, they're pretty pretty much all ears. Um, I don't I don't think I've ever, ever toured an artist on wedges. It's always been ears. It seems to be the way. Um, front of house likes ears. Band like ears. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the band really. But I think you know. I think I think it's potentially more the old, older bands who like monitors and, w- and want to have wedges. Yeah, it's always it it's always the deaf old bands who want to use yeah. monitors who. Need any ears? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm very happy about that. I'm glad I'm not, you know, trying to, I'm not having a fun of house uh, singer shout at me saying oh, I can't hear my vocals when they're just like well, as loud as I possibly go. And I think there. from uh, as a sound engineer, I would, I would prefer all bands or every musician that I deal with to really be on ears because then you can give them. I think a lot of musicians don't realise you can get a great mix in your ears and if you get a great mix in your ears, you perform so much better, you know? Yeah. And I've dealt with so many musicians who just don't want to touch them and then mm-hmm. they do it once and they suddenly go, well, that was good because they've had a bad experience. Yeah, Whereas I'm sure. like, if you give them a good stereo mix and do everything right for them, but mm-hmm. it also means it's a less of a headache when you're touring because you can as you say, have the desk all set up, ready to go, plug, play, your iron ears are already done, your mix is done. So when you're doing a festival, all you're worrying about is front of house. It's just so much mm-hmm. faster compared yeah. to, and you're not having to tour with wedges and... Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's a big part of it as well, yeah. touring wedges. When you're um, turning up to a venue and stuff like that, um, what kind of what songs do you do you use for tuning your wedge? Do you use a song 
or songs that are in the same genre as the band you're touring with, or do you have a set bunch of songs that you just um, always I've use? A, I've got a playlist, um, and it's changed slightly over the years. But um, yeah, it depends what I'm doing. Um, for rock stuff, I use... Well, actually, I, I tend to go in with the same song every time just to kind of get a good ground point, which is You Might Need Somebody by Randy Crawford. Right. Because um, it's just produced really well. There's heaps of bottom end, heaps of, like clear top end. It's just it's just wicked. I can tell when something's not right in a room pretty quickly with that. Um, yeah, I use that to kind of start and be like, I think just like had it before where I've been like, I think you're tops are way too loud or like your subs aren't loud enough let's mm. can we change that because it sounds pretty unnatural at the minute um but then after that i've got d'angelo's song um which is really love which is very like it's very acoustic you know how like when you're when you're eqing acoustic instruments like violins and acoustic guitars you don't want to do that sweep and destroy too much Mm. where you take out those harsh frequencies because if you start carving at it it starts to sound completely unnatural like it's fine to have a bit of that funkiness a bit of that like a bit too much 1k in your violin for example like i think that's just the character and that you know that that is just the how it's supposed to sound you don't have to kind of just carve it away and be like oh no i don't know that frequency because you'll, you'll take away you'll take away every frequency because if you boost any frequency in the violin it's gonna sound like mm. screech <laughs> like a screech um so that song's very it's, it's a bit spiky in certain frequencies and i kind of find that that gives me an idea of what it might sound like when there's violins on stage and acoustic guitars and mm -hmm. it's got yeah it's, i think it's a really well produced song but it has got like a lot of like 10k in the percussion and things and it will kind of give me an idea of certain things i kind of got that song locked down a bit in my mind about where things sit and it helps me when the band's going on um and i also use barracuda by heart I don't um know. which is it's a bit it's, it's very guitar heavy 80s rock with a female vocalist i find it's really good i use that on yonica and the amazons because it's very guitar it's similar with like i was saying about violins and things guitar amps have that that element of them as well whether they can be a bit like whoa hello mm. but an element of that's kind of good as well and i think barracuda has that to it and it's got quite piercing vocals and it's kind of it's good to have a bit of piercing but in the sense of getting your vocals to cut through a mix but mm. you know i think ears adjust to certain things as well um have you have you had the the, the time where you've walked into a venue and set up and you you, you stick on one of these tunes and the PA just, you straight away know this is not going to be pleasant whatsoever or you just, it's just not sufficient enough for you? Uh, yeah, there's been a handful. Generally with PAs, I'm a little bit like, it's, it's probably my weakest point a little bit in some senses because I sort of don't care what the PA is. I'm just like... A lot of the time you get what you're given. I mean, mm. if it's great, it's great. I'm like, cool, I'm happy with that. But if it's not great, I'm like, cool, well, that's what I'm given. Let's make the most out of it, you know? And I'll come back from a festival and one of my colleagues will be like, oh, what PA was it? I'll be like, don't know, it was a black one. I'll be like, oh, cool. <laughs> they like, black or brown? I'll be like, it was brown this time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, be like, it sounded as great. As, really as long as it's not purple, then you're okay. That's the uh, mm. that's the rules. Um, no, it, it's so true because... Uh, the, my um, my thought is if you're going into a venue which is an established venue you know that they're not going to have crap you know mm. it's going to be good and you know there, there's a, a few venues I've been into where this PA system has been hand built by a local company or something like that right okay and there's one St Luke's here has got a great PA system in it and it's perfect mm. for, the, for the, the space and it's built by a few of our friends Mm. and it's custom made but it sounds amazing but you get some engineers coming and kind of a bit snobby you yeah. know and, and like turn their nose down at it and you go just put some music through it yeah and the minute they do that they go right fine yeah <laughs> you know and it's one of the best sounding PAs for a room you know tuned to perfection and it's right. a delight to tune on uh, to play on and uh, yeah I, th I think that's 
what some engineers have to get away from that kind of oh it's not D&B mm. or it's not elacoustics or I mean yeah I get it I mean I've done a few function one like a band like pretty acoustic bands through function one and you're like oh great <laughs> like there goes my mid-range <laughs> but and I mean some of the, the graphic EQs at the end of that are looking pretty funky I'm not gonna yeah. lie but um you know you just do your best um I've had some great shows through Function One as well. Um, you just kind of deal with what you can do. I think you've got, I've done it for a few venues where I turn up and you know it's lacking. You, you just know it's going to be lacking, of, but you've just got to work with it mm. and not try and get reproduce something out of it that you know it can't achieve. Because yeah, you just end up butchering it, and then it just overall doesn't sound good. I think it's better to just get a good level. Uh, or a good sound at a lower level. Mm. This kind of balance more than in your face, but um, luckily that's uh, very rare that happens. Mm. Um, out of all the years, who's, what's your kind of highlight of a, a gig that you've either mixed or been involved in um, through the years? Oh, there's loads. I did, um, did a New Zealand show with Wilkinson last New Year's. That was amazing. That was really good. It felt like I was really exotic, just flying the other side of the world through this New Year's show. That was great. Was this um, a one-off? Sorry? Was it a one-off gig? Yeah, just a one-off. Yeah, we're headlining this festival when the clock struck midnight. I thought it was an incredible main stage festival, lots of people. Um, but yeah, that's such a, that's such a well-oiled machine, that show. It's incredible. It's, it's a real treat because Wilkinson himself really understands balance and making sure you don't fix he doesn't he's never like turn this up in my ears a bit he'll go over to the laptop and speak to the um the md and be like let's turn this synth line up in the track and i just i've got a big smile on my face because generally it's pretty flat and it's just a bit of like yeah you know yeah it's great um yeah so that's a good one lanterns on the lake i've done some headline sort of london shows with them and it's been incredible um i've been tears tears down my face crying because it's just this string section playing it's been really beautiful um lucy sprague and london shows have been great as well similar thing it's like i remember doing coco on my second second tour i'd ever done we're headlining coco and it's just like i've been to loads of shows at coco in london i couldn't believe i was there i was just like since the first song started i was welling up a bit um <laughs> did a show in poland with yonica uh, a festival we had, a, we had a really, really, really fun festival season with Yonica, I think a couple of years ago. And it, oh, man, it just feels, it felt like every day was just my birthday or something. We were doing these wicked shows going around the world. Um, and we did this show in Poland, and I got a sound check in the morning on a VI, uh, and it was sounding amazing. It sounded really good. Just so meaty in there, this rock band, and everything was just clear. The PA was wicked. But... Um, What's her name? Mo. Mo was playing on the main stage, the opposite side, and the band before us was um, oh, Young Fathers, oh, yeah. the Scottish band, mm -hmm. and they sounded incredible. And I was in the dressing room. I was getting so anxious because I could feel the sub just shaking our dressing room, being like, "How are we going to compete with that? Like, how are we going to come out after that?" It was so good. Um, and then we came out. And it was just it was just an amazing set. We did really well. Um, but then when MO's set finished, this massive crowd of people came over to the Yonica show and it was just flooded out. And like, ah, oh, and it was just sounding really good. The band, you could tell the band were having a good time. The lights were looking good. The tour manager, Ollie, was behind me doing lights as well. Um, and yeah, it was sounding good, looking good. The crowd were loving it. And uh, they were like cheering their name and uh yeah, I, I just, you know how it is when you like, you kind of catch the energy from the band. Yeah. But I love splitter tours. Um, I, mean, I love bus tours as well, but I just love splitter tours and that kind of, the energy it, it carries with the band when they're going, when they're on the up and everything that happens is exciting and they, you just hear yeah. in the band like, oh, we're going to go on this. And then, and, and, you know, it's, I love that. I love catching the energy and, you know, being part of that and feeling like you're part of them as well. When it's just like a skeleton crew, and you're hanging out with the band it just feels like you're you're part of them and you're all in it together and the, you know their achievements is your achievements and yeah. their happiness and being playing great shows is like shared you know I love man it. you're making me feel like, like i'm totally missing gigs 
<laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's um, it's fun, it's, it's like that. You you um, you get the buzz from it. There's an adrenaline rush. There's a bit of a drug involved in there because we do it because we love it. You know, or even being a musician, you know that feeling. You know when you're on stage and you're just that gig that just everything just clicks. You know, mm -hmm. and it reminds us why we do it all. No, it'll, ha yeah. it'll happen again time. someday. Um, yeah. What What would you say is like um, been the biggest challenge as a sound engineer over the years that you've you've come up against? I actually don't know. There hasn't been. There hasn't really been too many. I I remember struggling with this. Um, let me see what I, I wrote. It's funny <clears throat> not to have any challenges. Yeah, I mean, I have no challenges. Not enough. <laughs> um, it's been. Uh, I mean, I think it's probably more like social than sort of anything technological. Because I kind of feel like, what's the worst that can happen at any gig? Really, like mm. you, you always learn something. Even the bad gigs, you know, you. It might feel like I've had a bad gig, like before the mix was bad, being a bit of a grump and then be fine after. But like, really, what's the worst that can happen? Because like, you just you just do your best every day, really, don't you? you like, no one's going to like judge. Your mixes can only improve and you can only learn more. Like, you should never be afraid to like, just go in there and like, turn stuff up because it's not really rocket science, to be honest. I, I almost like miss being a beginner because I was mixing with such a basic ear and mixing because, you know, that needs to be louder, obviously. And like, and, oh, that needs more bass in it. Obviously, like I can hear that that needs more. And it was just so primitive. When I started, I just used these cookie cutter EQs on everything like my toms, just like, and it looks like a smiley face on my toms and, <laughs> and the kick. Oh, there we go. Yeah. And like, <clears throat> It was good to start out with, and like every every gig on that Lanterns tour, someone would come up and be like, "That's the best that band's ever sounded," and it just and they would tell the band like, "Is that sound? That's the best sounding gig I've ever been to, or whatever." I'm like, "I'm eight, I'm eighteen, and this is my first tour. <laughs> like, what is going on?" Um, but um, yeah, so it's good to kind of not get into habits of you know, being like, okay, that needs to be like that. Okay, I've done this a million times. Like, this mm. can be this. Like, I think just mixing with your ear and like not falling into habits and just making sure you're just doing what sounds good because, you know, there's always going to be that manager that comes up to you and is like, yeah, can I, it just needs to sound a bit warmer and the bottom end or like, needs a bit more like bass in the vocals and like, oh yeah, it needs to be like, oh, go away. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, I'll do what I can, but like, I, I always found that nerve wracking when you always had that that guy, you know. It was it was like when you were younger and doing pub pub and club gigs, mm. uh, or it was your local band gigs, and you always had like the father of the guitarist <laughs> in one of the bands standing over your shoulder, yeah, watching you what you're doing, and he's always like, "Oh, I can't hear the guitar enough. I can't hear," you know. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, I know you just want to hear your son's uh, yeah, yeah. guitar, but. You found that I find that when you've got tour managers and which I don't mind nowadays because before I took it as a bit of an offence, mm. whereas now I'm taking it more of a guide us because I don't know what your band should sound like. Mm, right. You know, um, I had to change my attitude on that because I used to get kind of get away from me. You know, why, why are you looking yeah, over my yeah. shoulder here? Whereas now I'm like, I'm more than happy for you to stand here and tell me what it should sound like. Mm. You tell me what you want, I'll make it sound like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as, for sure. As much as you can. Um, that I think that's basically one of my biggest challenges when I was coming mm. through the ranks was to change mm. my attitude towards that. Yeah, for sure. What's, um, uh, has all your gigs been perfect or is there something, any of them been bad or something bad has drastically happened when you go f I mean I know we all learn from our mistakes but there's yeah, also yeah. not mistakes but there's things that just happen and you're just like I just want this over <laughs> yeah I mean there's, yeah, there's been a good handful um, I mean basically all of it's been through digital desks 
and the the joys of just figuring out what the heck's going on. I'm sure mm-hmm. analog wasn't perfect by all means. And like, I'm sure you'd be like, oh, there's a cable that's broken inside the reverb unit. Like now I've got no reverb or something, but now it's like digital. Just anything can happen really. Mm. Um, I found that, yeah, I mean, I've got a few. Nothing too, nothing too wild really. It's mainly just like stuff that potentially, potentially I'd only notice. Let me have a think. One of them was a show in Spain where they sent me the, the spec and then when I landed in Spain and got in a taxi on the way to the, the venue, they sent me an email with a different spec and it was, it changed to a Midas Pro 2 and I just got a new MacBook. So I didn't, I didn't have a show file or the software, but I just got a new MacBook. So I downloaded the offline editor onto my new MacBook using Hotspot on my phone built this show file and I was like great and I got to the venue we actually had a sound check there um did the sound check and I was like cool it was a rush like trying to like get everything patched in and I literally I, I didn't have much like noise and stuff to play with and mix I was doing monitors from front of house as well which I didn't realize either I got there and I was like where's your monitor board so I got yeah so um and it was wedges mm. like it was a big like fairly big festival as well anyway um came to show time like laid on my file, did the show. And then I realized about halfway through the set that my monitors were, which one is it? Post fade. Oh, so, <laughs> and this, the, the band, like they were jumping levels or jumping around lows as well. And they're like keyboards and guitar effects and stuff. So I was like mixing it. And like the wages were just going crazy. Cause I was like, <laughs> it was following the front of house mix. And I was, it was when I realized, and I was like, what do I do? Do I just keep it like this or do oh. I? Yeah. It takes forever on a minus, doesn't it? To just click through every send. And like, yep. I mean, you can obviously do it beforehand, like and copy and paste it. And, but I mean, I think you can't even do it mid show if you copy and paste just that segment and stuff. But um, yeah, that was a pretty bad one. And Did you just leave that going for the whole set then? Yeah, well, the band was saying down the mics, down the PA, like, can we have more of this? And then they'd swap over and stuff, change oh. positions. <laughs> and like, oh, anyway, I was just getting like consolation from these like Spanish engineers and they'd just like say like something in Spanish, like, eh, we <laughs> fade. And then like hand on my shoulder, like, I was like, I'm trying my best. Crikey. That was a tough one. Um, what else? Oh yeah, Belladrum Festival. The Belladrum Festival of Lucy Spraggan on the main stage. And another Midas pro it was a pro two and um i took it from a pro one file so i did a festival i think i did why uh, not festival or something a pro one took it over and this was the first time i'd taken a pro one file to a pro two and my outputs were just non-existent mm-hmm. um so i was like oh that's weird and the system tech was like yeah that is weird and then i think i think we're trying things for a little bit and then we found like an output we could use on like as or something but then I got the MD of the band to talk down a mic, came on the PA and it was just reverb. And I was like, mm. what the hell is going on? I don't like that. That shouldn't be happening. So I got, um, it, went, it was like five minutes past stage time at this point. No. Um, and the MD, after the show, the MD said he looked over and I was just like, hands on my head, like, what is going on? It's probably the most stressed out I've ever been. Anyway, I just loaded up the house file. I was like, let's just go. And we went and I had to like, it's quite a lot of channels on her show. It's a lot of like violins and other instruments and random bits and bobs. And I had to just stick my headphones in and just be like, right, channel 38. Sounds like a violin. Type it in, <laughs> put it in the PA and like, off we go. <laughs> just like, and it's main stage, pretty big crowd. Just like, they're suddenly like, ah, and here comes a keyboard. And just sort of come into the PA. I mean, it took about three wow. songs before I was like, and I've got a mix. But you know how it is when you use like a, I had like a similar thing in um, Czech Republic where they just couldn't get a fault. They just couldn't figure out some patching stuff between them. I think I just used the house file for some reason. I can't remember why. I think, I think it wasn't loading. They had to re- keep rebooting the desk or something. It was, it was a um, digi grid. Um, and yeah, it was a similar thing. Yeah, I can't remember what happened there. I think, oh, it was all fine, but I was just using the house file and I was like, this is weird. Why are your effects labeled wrong and stuff? <laughs> like, why is this happening? I, like, I hate using house files because I always find like, work, like, you kind transferring of files, I'm never comfortable with it. Mm. You know, even though I'm like, 
I have this file here from my SD9 and it's a perfect file. And I, yeah. I, even if I plug into another SD9 with everything else, I'm still, I'm not convinced 100% that it's going to always work. I find that yeah. th that's always a stress, I think, even though I've got my, mm -hmm. my thumb uh, drive full of files, I, yeah. I don't trust any. <laughs> I know what you mean. Well, I think that summer I did with Yonica, I had, I think I just used one memory stick for everything, which is a very, very bad idea. I mean, I backed it all up, but I was just like, I just use this good memory stick. Mm. It's my goodie. Um, but like it would occasionally just weird out desks because yeah. I was, it was all on one memory stick and it was just loads of files. And since then I've just got a keychain of all my memories, all the different desks, all the different desks, memory sticks, just use those. Just keep, keep like Alan Heath files on one, on the Alan Heath stick. Mm. Um, because yeah, it was just weird out desks around across Europe. <laughs> I think there's I only like two shows where it weirded them out, but yeah, it's that, not, that's not a, a good one. That's the problem with modern technology. You know, there's no. uh, a lot more issues with it. If mm. you were to, um, what would you say is like the biggest lesson you th you've learned over the years that you could? Um, it's probably like just enjoy it. Just enjoy everything you do. I think enjoy it what's the worst that can happen i mean it, it can it can feel like it's really high stress kind of when there's a big crowd there it's there's lots of people to kind of keep happy like the band and, and the crowd like we do monitors you kind of want to make sure everyone's happy and but you just kind of feel like what's the worst that can happen i also feel like say yes to stuff and work it out later i mean it's just life isn't it you know like i'm sure it's with any career just say yes to something and then you can work it out like just keep it rolling. Like nothing's really that hard and scary. And if like there's a million people who are so genuinely delighted to help you out and show you things and mm -hmm. just, you know, say yes, the ball rolls and then, yeah, it's easy. Like, well, say easy, you know, just be positive, have mm -hmm. fun with the bands you work with and the people you work with. And it's contagious, isn't it? Just have a smile on your face. The, the singer looks down and you're like at the desk, like looking up like, Loving what you do, like having had so many bands say they look at front of house and bob in my head, like going crazy, and like they love that, you know. They, they're gonna want you back if they see you're enjoying it and you care. Yeah, you know? yeah totally. I, I I think a lot of bands appreciate that, especially when you show that you're you're interested in them, um, or talk to them about their tech spec, or or talk mm. to them about their sound, or um, if you show interest in people they all genuinely come back to you in a, a positive manner as well. Yeah, totally. um, but yeah, I mean, one day we'll get back to all this malarkey. Of, um, yeah, and, undoubtedly. And it'd be nice if festival season happened this year. Yeah. We'll wait and see. Um, but listen, we'll end it there. Thank you very much for your time. And for your share, sharing your wisdom. And um, we'll do it again sometime. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Scott. All the best to uh, you and Audio CP. It's nice you named your company after me. <laughs> <laughs> we hadn't met yet, but... but the good. funny thing is, I get asked why it's called that so many times. And it actually stands for Audio Cassette Player. Ah, okay. That's why it originally, what it originally stand, stood for. But okay. I, used to, I used to tell people, depending on what mood I'm in, uh, I was cocaine pusher or... <laughs> loads of other random yeah. there you Design. go anyway but we'll end it there thank you sir uh, it's been my pleasure thanks Scott it's great to see cool. you thanks for joining us for another session please remember to subscribe and like comment and we'll see you next week <laughs> <laughs>